So ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear uh, in presence and online participants, dear colleagues from the Austrian Ministry of Defense, General, embassies and permanent representations in Vienna, Vienna-based international organization and think tanks, the Diplomatic Academy, welcome to this panel discussion on the EU strategic compass. There is not much need to introduce the compass, a milestone for the EU's role in security and defense, product of many months of debate in Brussels, formally approved by the Foreign Affairs Council on 21st of March, and subsequently endorsed by the European Council. Shortly summarized, the Compass seeks to provide a geopolitical EU with guidance and a new level of ambition so that it can become a more assertive and decisive security provider, something which has become ever more urgent in light of the return of war to the European continent. It assesses the EU's strategic environment and outlines concrete policy objectives and clear deadlines in four areas. Crisis management, it's the chapter act in the strategic compass with a rapid deployment capacity of up to 5,000 troops as a flagship initiative. Resilience, the chapter secure, Capability development, the chapter invest, perhaps the most concrete and promising in the compass. And finally, partnerships. Doing so, the strategic compass addresses a few of the known shortfalls in capabilities, structures, decision-making processes, and financing that have so far prevented the common security defense policy from acting rapidly and robustly. Part strategy, part action plan. The strategic compass is a significant upgrade from past and current EU strategy papers and a move in the right direction, at least in my opinion, starting with its effort to align the strategic thinking of 27 member states, each with its own foreign and defense policies. The OEP has committed itself to the study of the strategic compass. Our institute has contributed to the book Der Strategische Kompass, Der Europäischen Union, Ziele, Perspektiven und Chancen für Österreich, which was presented by Defense Minister Claudia Tanner on 8 November 2021. This contribution is also accessible in form of a policy paper on the OEP's website. On 6 April, the OEP also contributed to the conference on the strategic compass of the EU, What Now? organized at the Landesverteidigung Academy in Vienna. What now, indeed? Now the real work can begin. There is a long list of deliverables and the generous wording do, does not guarantee successful implementation. As High Representative Joseph Borrell pointed out, the strategic compass is anything but a magic stick. Benefiting from the endorsement of the member states, the Compass's successful implementation will nonetheless depend on their political willingness, which can never be taken for granted. The operationality of the Compass's agenda will need to overcome several obstacles, starting with the EU's slow decision-making processes. Having clearly state signaled that it seeks a bigger global role and it is willing to pursue its interests through traditional hard power, the EU will be left exposed if it cannot. <clears throat> will the EU be able to keep up the momentum for developing its defense capabilities? Will the strategic compass be a game changer for EU security and defense? Adversely, has it already been overtaken by Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, as Nick Whitney, a senior fellow at the uh, European Council on Foreign Relations, ECFR, recently argued in a paper titled The EU Strategic Compass, Brand New, Already Obsolete. To answer these questions and many others, I asked three keynote panelists to guide our reflection this afternoon. Jana Pulierin is with us online. Jana has been the head of the ECFR's Berlin office and a senior policy fellow since January 2020. She also directs ECFR's Reshape Global Europe project, 
which seeks to develop new strategies for Europeans to engage, to understand and engage with, with the changing international order. Before joining ECFR, Jana headed the Alfred von Oppenheim Center for European Policy Studies at the German Council on Foreign Relations. Prior to this, she was an advisor on disarmament, arms control and non-proliferation in the German Bundestag, where she also worked on matters relating to German and European foreign and security policy. Jana has an impressive record of fellowships and academic responsibilities. She is inter alia a board member of the German Atlantic Society and a member of the extended board of women in international security. Saskia Stachowicz is a senior research fellow at the Central European University, CEU, Department of International Relations and Department of Gender Studies, and an affiliated senior researcher at the OEP. She currently heads the research project Risky Borders, Gender, Gender and Race in EU Border Security, funded by the Austrian Science Fund, and she has published widely in the fields of gender and security and um, security feminist theories in international relations, the privatization of war and security, and Frontex and the EU border security architecture. Stefan Huber is seconded by the European External Action Service to the Austrian Federal Ministry of Defense as a senior advisor of the General Director for Defense Policy. Allow me to underline that his secondment is the first EEAS secondment to a Ministry of Defense and not to a Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is a sign of the dynamic of EU security and defense policy. Stefan has a long career within the European Commission and the EEAS, notably as EEAS Head of Division for Mission Support and Mission Personnel for Civilian Missions. He has also served on the field in the EU delegations to Japan and Afghanistan. Stefan will speak on his own behalf and not, of course, on behalf of the ministry, nor of the EEAS. Our discussion will address three series of questions. The first session will focus on the rational and substance of the compass. Our three keynote panelists will drive us through the strengths and weaknesses of the document. And I would also like this first part of the discussion to explore the convergence between the EU and NATO at less than one month than the NATO summit in Madrid at the end of the, this month of June. The second session will focus on Austria's specific situation. Austria has been quite active in contributing to the strategic dialogue, uh, the strategic dialogue phase until July 2021. And I would pay tribute to the role of Ambassador Florian Raunig, uh, which we, we have the chance to have in this, in this room. Um, but the question is now, how have Austrian objectives and interests been taken into account? Finally, the, the third session, we address the return of war in Europe. We know that crises have always helped the EU to move forward. The process of strategic compass was disrupted by two unforeseen events. First, the withdrawal of the US and their allies from Afghanistan, and then Russia's aggression against Ukraine. The need for a strategic compass has out of doubt been reinforced by Russia's full-blown invasion of Ukraine. Russia has given up, up a wake-up call, French President Macron said. However, the ongoing crisis has also diverted the attention from the compass and somehow questioned the accuracy and timeliness of part of its provisions. We have a bit less than two hour, hours ahead of us. Each of the keynote panelists will be invited to take the floor under each session, elaborate in five, seven minutes on any aspect they feel relevant, and might shortly react after the colleague's presentation. I suggest that we keep the Q&A segment and the exchange with the participants to the end, and I will make sure that sufficient amount of time is devoted to that. 
Without further ado, let me open the first set of issues and pass the floor to Jana Pulieri. Jana, the floor is yours. Thanks again for being with us today. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I regret that I cannot be with you in person, it would be much nicer, um, but yeah, I'm stuck in Berlin. Nevertheless, so the first question you want to address is whether the strategic compass is a quantum leap forward um, and uh, whether it has met our expectations. And I very much agree with what you said in your introductory remarks. So for me, uh, my expectations were met, um, especially um, maybe not so much with the first draft of the compass, but, but actually after the final revision, I think it became um, better <laughs> over, over the month. Um, for me, um, it pro provides a concrete roadmap for the EU as an actor in security um, uh, and defense. And I think um, it was also timely uh, to publish the Compass. Um, there were discussions to delay it due to the war. And I think its content wouldn't have changed so much uh, kind of two, two months later. So I was, I was actually happy to see it published. Um, what I think uh, are the two biggest strengths for me, if I would uh, choose only two. Um, one is I'm really happy to see um, how the EU-NATO relationship is dealt with, um, that uh, NATO is clearly identified as the EU's most important partner, and that um, this obstacle um, between the two institutions um, has been solved. I think the obstacle on, a way, uh, on the way for a stronger EU has very much been that there was so little consensus between the member states about the overall ambition of the EU, especially vis-a-vis -vis NATO. And um, I think different member states had different ideas, um, and especially during the Trump presidency, it became clear with this um, debate about, a toxic debate about strategic autonomy, um, that member states had quite diverse ideas. Um, but I think the Compass has solved this in a very nice way because it um, is not positioning the EU as an alternative to NATO. Um, but it's really emphasizing the constructive cooperation between the two organizations um, and kind of the need for both organizations to work um, closely together. Um, and I think that is visible all over the compass. And I think that is greatly appreciated, especially um, in two ways. I think first, um, I was really grateful to see that the division of labor between the EU and NATO um, has become more distinct. Um, so I think um, the Compass openly acknowledges that NATO is um, the institution uh, that is responsible for European territorial um, defense um, and for deterrence, um, and the EU's um, focus is uh, more on crisis management. But I think, so I think um, the roles are pretty clear, which is very good, but at the same time, I think what the Compass does is um, it positions um, the EU as an enabler for European defense um, in all other aspects. And um, so I think to see the EU as a crucial enabler for uh, Europe's territorial defense is absolutely necessary. Um, and I see this through the commitment uh, in the compass by EU member states to invest more and better in defense capabilities and innovative technologies. Um, because I think that in the coming years, um, after the German site and then, but also with this increase of defense spending all over Europe, um, we will see an urgent need to, um, to spend better, not only to spend more, but to spend better, um, to align procurement processes, to develop together. And I think the Compass um, sets very nice incentives. Um, the uh, the EDA report on collective investment gaps, the uh, VAT waiver, um, the idea to have more money for the European Defense Fund. So, and I think these initiatives are really needed because I think that we will face tough time to convince European citizens to sustain um, this high level of defense spending all over Europe. And we have to make a convincing case, as I said, that we don't only spend more, but that we spend better and that we achieve more at less cost. Um, so 
I think that's good. And I think that's also beneficial to NATO because I think our aim should be um, when um, procuring and developing military capabilities in an EU framework to also at the same time um, boost NATO's deterrent and, uh, deterrence and defense capacity um, and to develop um, stuff that is then can then also be used within NATO, basically. Um, that, I think, is very beneficial for the overall relationship and uh, could be a valuable contribution to European defense uh, by the EU. And I think also everything that is said about military mobility uh, in the compass um, will greatly benefit European um, defense and also the measures planned on European resilience. So I think um, kind of the work share between the two organizations has become clearer, but the EU is an enabler for European defense. And I think this is a good development. So this is what I see as um, really a strength. Um, another strength that I see is um, that I think now the pressure will mount on the European Union when it comes to crisis management. Although I acknowledge that I see uh, intervention fatigue after Afghanistan and Mali, and I see that Europeans are really skeptical about um, military interventions, but I think um, because the US is focusing on Asia and now on Ukraine, I think um, it has become clear after Afghanistan that they are no longer focused on other um, issues in our periphery and that we have to do it on our own. So, and I think that we should definitely not lose sight of the huge challenges that will emerge from regions such as Africa or um, the Middle East, because actually the war now creates uh, famine, creates instability also in these regions. And so I think we will see uh, an enhanced need for crisis management, um, not only crisis management, but also um, stabilization efforts. And I think that will be on, on Europe. Um, and this is a big problem for Europe or has been a big problem in the past because although we have strengthened our operational structures and capabilities, member states, have made little use of them. And so whenever basically member states voted in favor of an EU mission or operation in the council, afterwards they were very shy in providing the necessary forces uh, to sustain the mission. And I think a large part of this was also the consensus-based decision-making process. Um, that was also the reason why many member states prefer to kind of act with others in, in some sort of coalition of the willing. Um, and that we saw this as increasing trend in European security. And so I think the Compass has now initiatives to make, um, uh, ha has presented initiatives to make a European crisis management more flexible, faster, and more effective. Um, from a German perspective, uh, especially Article 44 is, um, is very promising um, because for the German government, it's really difficult to engage in um, coalitions of the willing militarily due to our constitution. So um, coalitions of the willing within the EU framework, um, if, if we could make that work, that would be a, a huge step forward. Although I admit it's not a silver bullet, uh, but I think it would um, be an incentive for more member states to contribute forces and capabilities to operations. And also I think the European Peace Facility could, could uh, be a useful instrument um, here when it comes to um, first, um, coming back to the partnership basket, working with kind of difficult reg regions and kind of building partnerships. But also, I think the idea is also to use the EPF for to, to, to help um, European member states uh, collective action outside the EU framework. So I think these are two things that I think are positive um, or where I have high hopes. And um, the only I mean, there are some things where I'm not that convinced, but um, so just to pick one, um, I, I'm not really not sold on the rapid deployment capacity. Um, I still need to be convinced that this uh, will actually work. I, <laughs> to me, it's just very difficult um, to buy this um, kind of, it's based on the same battle, ground, uh, battle group concept, um, but kind of it's a totally new concept. And, and so I, I don't see why we managed to do this we have failed to provide the 60,000 that we had envisioned once, the 1,500, the better groups were never used. So I, I'm just not, not really convinced um, that this would be a game changer, but um, I hope that I'm wrong on this. And maybe I leave it with this as initial statement. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. I would agree with you on this last point. I, I am picking also the, 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 the point you made on convincing the citizens. I think it's extremely important to maintain a clear communication with the national parliaments and with the citizens of the Union during the implementation phase of the, com the, the COMPASS. I think that more transparency and democratic oversight on European defence is absolutely uh, necessary. Um, especially considering the lack of mention throughout the strategic compass of the role that parliaments normally play in budgetary processes. Uh, thank you so much. I will pass the floor to uh, Stefan Huber to provide us uh, with this reading rooted in his uh, institutional experience of the, of the EU. Stefan, you have the floor. Thank you, Loïc. Um, looking at the expectations vis-a-vis uh, -vis the compass, uh, I remember the critical voices at the beginning, uh, especially from academia, but not only, saying it would just be another paper, um, it would be too bureaucratic as an exercise and probably just be a methodology. Uh, I think those voices were useful and, and um, also addressed. But let me turn uh, to the High Representative Borel, who announced uh, at the presentation of the first draft, saying that the compass would be the document of his mandate. And um, I picked this up because I think the compass makes uh, externally visible um, achievements that have not been so visible internal uh, developments and achievements um, uh, and initiatives in the CSTP uh, uh, activity uh, that have made the compass possible. I, I refer, will not cite all the uh, uh, programs and, and uh, but 10 years ago, we didn't have all these structures that today make it possible to roll out the, the implementation plan uh, of the compass. I mean, we just talked before this uh, conference started about the number of papers that are um, uh, uh, scheduled. And so I think uh, uh, the uh, document is not just a document of Mr. Borrell's mandate, but it builds on, on a quite significant success in institution building uh, in, in Brussels. Uh, more important for me was the foreword that uh, uh, the High Representative um, wrote, and basically this was his personal message. Uh, when he presented the first draft, uh, because for me, this is uh, something which has to do with the expectations. Uh, he reminded you, the member states, but also the citizens, um, that the EU faced a dangerous world. Uh, he said Europe is in danger. So this resonates today uh, certainly differently than, than uh, last uh, July. Um, and um, he also used some, some very uh, important keywords. Uh, he used the word strategic shrinkage as a risk for the EU, uh, the EU running the risk of becoming uh, ir irrelevant. So if we uh, now measure the end result uh, with, with his words, I think there's quite a um, uh, reason to, to believe that the compass lives up to this uh, HRVP's uh, political message. Um, for me, the compass is something I like to call a yes, we can moment uh, for, for the European Union. It, it's all about uh, uh, a frame for the implementation of political ambition. Uh, and it demonstrates uh, how much um, margin of maneuver the Treaty of Lisbon has provided, but has perhaps not been used in the early years of, of Lisbon. Then uh, expectations, in my view, are overfulfilled from the member states. Um, the, you mentioned the dialogue phase, which was, uh, some would have probably said it's a risky exercise. Um, the member states have produced an uh, astonishing uh, amount and uh, high quality of papers, food for thought papers. And uh, 
alone in groups, have presented them to other member states. Many of them have been underwritten by a huge number of member states and contributed not only to, to fulfill the promise that the Compass would be member state driven, but also reached a level, I think, uh, unseen so far of uh, discussion among member states about uh, security policy topics. So here, again, uh, for me, fully fulfilled. Then uh, you also asked the question about breakthrough uh, aspects. And uh, um, uh, I mentioned what the high representative said. I think this was a breakthrough in itself to, to show uh, how dramatic the, the geopolitical uh, uh, change uh, of the years, last years were. Then, uh, I'd like again to return to, to criticism of the EU. Uh, we heard, yes, that there's an ambition that is announced and then the commitments, for example, fourth generation is a bit more lukewarm. Uh, I see the Compass as, as an answer to this criticism. Uh, uh, where uh, a look at the, uh, we'll come back to it, at the implementation plan uh, for the next question, uh, shows that the resolve is visibly uh, much more um, credible. Uh, of course, um, the Compass, in my view, raises the stakes uh, in terms of the urgency to act, um, it's certainly a bit a bit early to to make an assessment. But the implementation plan, when you compare it to different roadmaps and action plans that we are used to with European institutions, it is a very ambitious one. I mean, it's more than sixty percent of the measures foreseen in the compass um, are scheduled for this year. Uh, which, which means the administrations, both at national and, and European level, are in full action mode, I, I would say, and it's quite impressive uh, 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 just to look at the list. Then, um, again, the breakthrough aspect, I would like to point to, to the Compass as an extension of the global strategy. You mentioned in your introduction, it's part strategy, part action plan. We have to look at the compass on, on these both uh, aspects. And um, as a critics, yes, uh, EU and member states have been uh, facing criticism that the announced comprehensive approach did perhaps not uh, work well enough. And I think the compass is an answer to this criticism. Uh, of course, uh, deliverables have to be than shown, but it is a very credible uh, attempt, I would say, uh, to, to achieve a closer alignment between the EU and, and member states. I pass to strengths and weaknesses. I will concentrate on strengths if you allow me. <laughs> uh, of course, I said already the implementation of 60% uh, uh, immediate implementation, I would say. Then, um, I like to, to refer to the processes, because without processes in Europe, you cannot uh, reach achievements. Uh, there's a bureaucratic aspect, certainly, uh, and, and a methodological aspect. But um, what is, I think, important to see is how Europe jumps in, in different capacities, uh, as a pure secretariat, as a coordinator, uh, or as, as the penholder. The EES was the penholder for the compass, uh, which worked out in the end very, very well. So uh, while I see a certain gradual shift uh, of the center of gravity in, in security policy towards Brussels, I would like to emphasize that the compass has managed the um, also member state expectations that Europe should not be a centralizer, um, but, but uh, um, adapt its role, uh, depending on where uh, core aspects are stronger or more intergovernmental or more integrative. So I think this is a, a success. Um, 
I would like also to, to cite uh, Sven Biskop, who said, on substance, the compass is a defense strategy. Uh, um, and this, again, for me, this is a success because there was none before. Um, as a conclusion, I would say, uh, uh, in fact, what you said in the introduction, I have found it uh, in an article of Dan Daniel Field uh, saying the compass is a, a strategic paper and an action plan. What is missing? I look at the watch and try to catch up. Um, I think the compass was much more at risk of being overloaded. Uh, uh, at some point, it looked like we were trying to, to add and add topics and areas. I think this, this uh, uh, the entry side shows that, uh, that uh, uh, they have managed this. So, uh, Perhaps one issue that is only partially addressed in the final uh, document is uh, something I have noted in one of the articles that you have uh, written, Rick, is this clarification and synchronization, uh, you have called it, of the different instruments. In my view, the, the compass brings together all the work strands of CSTP. Um, for, for an insider or expert, this may be uh, easy to grasp, but perhaps not enough for, 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 the, for the public. So there's something that could be uh, improved. Uh, another example, and here again, I compare with your analysis, is perhaps uh, Article 42.7, the assistance clause. Now there is a document foreseen for, for this month um, to look at scenarios and, and exercises. But I think this is a, a, a topic that, that is uh, uh, extremely important. Another topic uh, that was not uh, uh, included is the issue of unanimity or uh, majority voting. Uh, it interested me a lot because uh, I'm not sure how far this is actually known. Uh, um, the, the coalition agreement uh, of this government in Austria uh, has, has a a small passage uh, favoring majority voting in some areas of CS <coughs> CFSP. So where has this gone? Uh, the High Representative gave us a, a hint when he said ah, too many too many member states uh, not open to it, and some of those who were silent probably were also against it. But I find it an interesting part that uh, that the Austrian governmental the coalition agreement includes it. I haven't seen much of it in the action um, uh, or in the public field, uh, which, which I think is a, is a pity. I say it not to, to, to drive uh, um, or to support uh, a certain political development, but uh, there is, of course, uh, uh, a need to think about uh, 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 majority voting. Uh, when we think of some blockages that we had in CFSP, uh, when it comes to resolutions and to the condemning of, of certain uh, third, third countries, where it is unfortunate when, when you have uh, uh, one, sometimes two, rather one member state uh, blocking a consensus. Uh, so uh, one of the most vocal supporters uh, were certainly Nordic countries, and I think that would have been uh, a means to, 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 to talk more about it. Uh, now, uh, if you permit still some, some words on, on, on uh, NATO, I mean, it was very well explained by our first uh, speaker. Uh, the document has 29 references on NATO. That in itself says a lot. Um, it is also, again, the expression of achievement before the compass was written, we have 70 areas of cooperation between the EU and NATO. Um, so in the last couple of years, there was a clear acceleration uh, of cooperation. Uh, one last sentence on the issue of complementarity versus uh, duplication risk. Uh, I think one has to be careful when you look at, at operations. Uh, I've been in this civilian uh, operation and the head, operational headquarters for civilian missions. And in order to have a civilian mission, NATO also has uh, uh, 
the possibility to make civilian missions. You need the full spectrum of, of the planning and operational cycle of a mission. You cannot uh, live without planets. Uh, so uh, it's not so much an issue of duplication, especially in the fields of mission. And I would like to cite uh, Mr. Pedro Serrano, now head of cabinet of, of uh, Mr. Borrell, before the Deputy Secretary General in charge in the ES of all the CSTP services, who, who, who has made a comparison saying, when uh, 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 you may have only a small car and not the, uh, the Rolls Royce or supercar that some other organization may offer you, but sometimes you want to have your own car. And I think uh, in the issue of duplication, we have to be careful that uh, uh, we have also the full capacity uh, to uh, organize, plan, uh, uh, command, and conduct uh, our missions ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned the continuity between the EU general uh, strategy of 2016 and the, 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 the strategic compass. I was struck actually by the contrast between the quite optimistic tone of the EUGS uh, six years ago and the very gloomy and dark picture. You mentioned Borrell's forward, uh, the, the Europe is in danger. Uh, so the, the contrast at six years of distance. So is it, a, is it a failure of the soft power of the EU and uh, maybe something we could, uh, we could come back uh, to uh, during the, the Q&A uh, session? Thank you so much. Saskia, please, the, the floor yes. is yours. Um, thank you, Loic, for, for including me in this. Um, is the strategic compass a quantum leap forward? Well, to political scientists, it's always surprising if there's integration at all in the security field because we have so many theories and approaches that tell us that this basically cannot happen. It does happen, it did happen. So in this sense, certainly a success. But I would like to draw your attention to another level of this field of study, because we heard so much expertly explained about processes and instruments, but documents such as the strategic compass, they do other things too. They do other kinds of work. And that, that kind of work is identity construction. So the strategic compass does not only tell us what to do and what to implement and how, it also says a lot about who the EU wants to be as a security actor. It constitutes Europeanness. What does it mean for Europe to be a security actor? What does security mean? What does the EU mean? What does European mean in this sense? And um, like it's asked me to reflect a little bit on this broader process. What are the conceptual uh, implications of this? Because certainly processes matter, but identity does too, as we're seeing in a, in a massive crisis of the EU uh, in its identity in all of the policy fields. Um, and uh, here, just briefly, cautionary points that I think um, we should be keeping in mind when thinking through what kind of identity is the strategic compass constructing. And one is certainly that, and I realize it tested, but is the danger of militarization. Not necessarily that the military, the buildup of military capabilities that is envisioned is problematic in itself, but I think we have to think, keep thinking hard about what is the link between an all encompassing sense of threat and the enhancement of military capabilities. Um, so that we're not constructing this link unquestionably, and uh, so that we not subsume all kinds of societal challenges and um, conflicts with regards to security. The strategic compass thinks widely and rightly so, uh, and includes threats such as decarbonization and migration and so on. But security scholars tell us we have to think about what we're doing when we're reframing certain societal issues in terms of security. And that is something I think we should uh, continue to be mindful uh, of. And also that we're not constructing a too large or that the missing link does not become too big between the elaborate threat constructions or threat descriptions that the strategic compass entails and the concrete plans for enhancement 
of capabilities, build up of infrastructures, uh, institutions, cooperative mechanisms, and so on and so forth. So there is space here for the big question, what is it that we politically want to achieve within this tension? And um, one could say it's not the job of the strategic compass to define this, but I think you know to to include thoughts about where it is defined and how the strategic compass then relates to this is of the utmost importance. Um, because we do have to approach the issues such as environmental degradation outside of there being a security threat and thinking about how we're going to do that and how that relates to the strategic compass and how we cannot just understand these challenges as yet another strategic risk, I think is important. And um, another thing that that uh, strikes me quite intensely when reading the strategic compass is that this momentous, this, this impetus towards you know, being a security actor, being robust, being willing, being um, assertive, being competitive, it very often is written against um, the EU's own imagined past, if you will. So there is this slight delegitimization and problematization of what the EU has been as a security actor um, in terms of diplomatic, uh, dialogue oriented, privileging soft power, these kinds of approaches. And um, this, this is in the document. And I think the question is how, how do we deal with this? The problem, the document really also problematizes these issues and says, you know, cooperative multilateralism, peaceful interdependence, these are sources of insecurity. Um, and because they're becoming increasingly conflictual, they're becoming weaponized. And um, at the same time, the compass is strong about making these values, if you will, and these approaches an important rationale for why we need a stronger and more robust approach. So it says, you know, um, multilateralism, rules-based international order, human rights, fundamental freedoms, democratic values. These are all the motivations why we're even, even doing this. This is why we want to become more robust. Um, but then there's very little, little meaningful deliberation on how we can strengthen these values. Um, so if we draw them up in such documents, I think the consequences need to be uh, thought of as well. Um, again, we could say this is not the job of the strategic compass, but I think we cannot have these conversations as if they did not seep into all kinds of other policy fields. And I think I'm going to stop right here for this one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saskia. Your remarks uh, bring me to the the protective tone of the compass. I think the compass is indicative of a mindset which has already encroached on many areas of EU policy, um, that of a Europe that protects. Uh, we are getting closer to the doctrine that Richard Youngs of Carnegie Europe has called protective security. And it's a far cry from the EU's idealistic origins and the more progressive optimistic approach as I was mentioning a few minutes ago. In contrast, the compass uh, threatens to take the EU further down a kind of protective path. And I think it's, a, it's also uh, linked with what you, what you said. Thank you so much. I very much enjoyed this first session. Uh, I learned a lot. I suggest we move directly to the second session, which will be more devoted to uh, the specific case of Austria. The strategic compass inevitably challenges certain of Austria's interests and priorities due in Terralia to its limited military capacities and its status of neutrality. However, just like its neighbors, Austria needs to be prepared for a more confrontational European security order. I will more particularly ask Saskia Stachowicz and Stefan Huber to provide us with their views. Saskia, Minister Tan invited you to join her on 8 November 2021 when she presented her book on the strategic compass to the press. Stefan, you moderated the conference jointly organized by the Defense Ministry and the French EU Presidency on 6 April. Thank you for sharing your opinion on Austria's specific situation with regards to EU security and defense. Maybe one anecdote to trigger the discussion. I was personally struck by the number of press articles calling Austria 
to rethink its policy of neutrality, or at least to show flexibility in adapting its neutrality to changing conditions last week when Finland and Sweden opted to join the Atlantic Alliance. Let me mention a few of them. Their standard, neutral, uh, neutrales Österreich, wie unrealistisch ein NATO-Beitritt ist. Die Presse, Österreich muss nun mit Finnland und Schweden der NATO beitreten. Deutsche Welle, will Austria abandon neutrality to join NATO? Even the Irish Times and many others this goes far beyond, of course, the strategic compass and the scope of our discussion today. But can we say that the current circumstances in Europe have generated an instant verité, as we would say, uh, we would say in French, for Austria? Thank you very much. Saskia, the floor is yours. Yes. Um, well, what were Austria's interests and can it be happy with the outcome? I think probably, um, my colleagues are again better placed to answer this in terms of the intrinsic discussions and the engagement of Austrian actors with this process. Um, from you know a, a more detached perspective, a more broader Austrian, probably domestic perspective, I think the answer to this question depends on who we think Austria is. And Austria, and this brings us again to this question of identity, uh, but on the one hand, there seems to be an Austria that is very engaged in the international mm -hmm. arena, an Austria that is active in the European Union, that is very active uh, in especially the security field, and um, who clearly has a deep commitment and interest to become part of a European security and defense culture and institutional framework. And, um, has done so uh, without much attention by the public, I think, uh, and has also, if, if we look at PESCO and the contributions that Austria has made to this. So Austria is clearly eager and willing and doing the work. Um, and the beauty of the, of the strategic compass is probably that it allows for this wiggle room, so to speak. So Austria can have this, you know, more international security identity and live it to the fullest. But at the same time, this does not impede on um, the very cautionary and um, vague debates we're having around these issues in a more domestic political arena. So I worry a little bit that we will have a further drifting apart of these two Austrias, the one that is active and that is doing things, and the other that is stuck in the domestic debates around neutrality, how much it relates to Austrian identity. Many of those articles you just cited really um, make this point. They, they give us a lot to think about how political identity is formed in Austria, how it relates to issues around defense and security. And um, there are several themes and, and topics I think that Austria can no longer run away from, but continues to do so miraculously. So thinking about, you know, what is the role of the armed forces in, the, in Austria? What's, what's the role of these armed forces in this society and in the larger European context? What's the role of, of neutrality? What does it mean to be actively neutral? All of these questions um, have a life of their own, it seems, from Austria's engagement with, the, with stuff uh, like the strategic compass. So maybe, 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 again, there is a point now where we can have these conversations. Uh, but I didn't see them happening when the strategic compass was announced. I don't see them happening now. I see them again detached and mostly with regards to, to the situation, um, to the Russian war against Ukraine. So a disconnect between various Austrias, I would conclude. Very true. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Stefan, please. Thank you. Yeah, my first remark was very similar. I mean, I have to add that I lived 30 years abroad, so uh, the uh, Austrian insight, uh, I'm perhaps missing a few years, but uh, I think the most striking issue is that Austria has been a very faithful uh, EU member and has uh, fully um, gone the EU way in terms of strengthening of uh, CFSB and CSTP, and uh, sometimes a bit 
more slowly, but always faithfully. And uh, uh, this is also very clear uh, when you look at different strategic documents. Uh, uh, I, I look, for example, at the two last uh, security uh, strategies, where you uh, can say that the core element uh, of, of the Austrian uh, security policy is the uh, principled acknowledgement, if not conviction, that an improved uh, EU security policy, a deepened EU security policy, is beneficial to the Austrian situation and strengthening the Austrian security policy. And Austria has behaved that way. So I was looking for, um, um, let's say, occasions where Austria would have, in the last uh, more than 20 years, uh, been difficult in terms of uh, a security policy partner. I only detected the European Peace Facility, where at the end of 2020, perhaps uh, the, the uh, Austrian negotiation position was, was uh, uh, a bit reluctant, but otherwise not much of a sign. Uh, uh, so uh, I, I mentioned this because, because uh, not only has the threat assessment uh, uh, around Europe, also for Austria, dramatically deteriorated, um, there's also a conclusion also by big member states that uh, the challenges are of such a magnitude that they cannot face them alone. Uh, so, um, um, what is uh, another uh, uh, point that is certainly a bit astonishing that while we have this, this support, Austrian political support for the EU uh, development, and a lot of things have happened in the last 15, 20 years on the CSTP side. Uh, but you have an absence of political debate to some extent, even academic debate, because when you look for articles, you have to go back to 2003, 4, 5, a few in 14, 15, but not much more than that. So, uh, but in any case, um, um, I, can, I can simply, Confirm that this, this commitment, this part of Austria that you were referring to, uh, was also uh, continued in, in all the contributions to, to the Compass in ministerial and technical level. A very, I would say, faithful contribution uh, that is, uh, uh, in one way, very reassuring. And, and, uh, and uh, um, yeah, uh, I wanted to cite just one. Uh, ministerial uh, message that said uh, Austria expects from the Compass clear political guidance, concrete strategic objectives to define what kind of security and defense actor the EU needs to be. Uh, it's very similar to the language of, of the European uh, representatives, of course, uh, but, but again, then I think uh, because you asked us also to look into the Austrian Austrian contribution, what were the, the objectives? I think, uh, certainly, as you mentioned, and that's ironic, you know, here, uh, the OSCE and the UN are referenced more often uh, than in the, in the early drafts, and also those that were not published. So I think this is an achievement uh, beyond the duty of, of Austria as a seat. Uh, uh, for, the, for these organizations. Um, I mean, we have to remind ourselves that the reference to the UN is enshrined in the EU treaties and, and in all our, uh, uh, basically all our missions and operations follow, uh, follow that, that uh, and try to protect that overall framework. I think uh, Austria has also um, um, uh, been able to, to contribute a lot on the certainly political priority for Austria on the Balkans, but I, I would like to explain it in, in, in a few words. Uh, I mentioned earlier the importance of a, a parallel uh, action of the national and the EU level. So 
when I look at the EU Balkan strategy and the Austrian activity, which constantly refers to the EU strategy and, and um, adds nothing in terms of uh, different political substance or different political orientation, but complements the European level with a quite genuine and, and successful, I think, variety of bilateral and multilateral contents. And uh, I think uh, reading the compass, one perhaps doesn't see that much, uh, the potential of aligning the bilateral uh, initiatives of uh, which basically every member state has, they have the bilateral defense agreements, bilateral um, meetings with defense policy directors of also with third countries and so on. And I think Austria has set here a very convincing example how, how uh, on substance and also process uh, it, it, it managed to um, contribute to the uh, uh, fulfillment of, of the Balkan strategy. Uh, you have asked uh, us whether the hour of truth, the de vérité, is there. Uh, uh, I think, uh, as I said, all the strategic documents uh, show uh, a commitment uh, of, of Austria. Um, uh, I think I mentioned also Article 42.7. There is um, some, some uh, work to do. Uh, I think uh, uh, one has to ask, uh, ask oneself also in the broader EU uh, context, what kind of scenarios can happen? Uh, 42.7 is assistance clause. What kind of aggression can happen? What type of aggression can it be that would allow Austria to, to invoke the Irish clause? Um, uh, I think this is one of the activities we may have more clarification in the new, with the new document coming from the ES on Article 42.7 this month. But I think um, looking at the scenarios from the Austrian side, could be very helpful. Uh, could also be helpful to look at why the Baltic and Nordic countries were so interested in expanding well before the compass uh, in expanding the the uh, uh, operational um, aspect of Article Forty Two Seven. So, uh, of course, I think there is an uh, hour of truth because uh, there is. There is a discrepancy. You mentioned these two different Austrias, but I think there's a discrepancy also by the uh, representation of, of, of Austria with its political represent, representatives and with the, the administration, the administrative uh, and technical level, because uh, for some uh, time it worked out well to, to for example, underwrite PESCO commitments, and voluntary commitments, but at some point you have to uh, live up to those commitments, and especially on PESCO, even if Austria is in good company, the fulfillment of PESCO commitments is, is, is not uh, glorious. Uh, all those, uh, the 2%, but I mean, on, on those who are interested can read the HRVP's uh, third progress report on, on BESCO, which uses very pedagogical language to address the many member states who didn't live up. Uh, but this should not be an excuse. Uh, so I, I would say this discrepancy of saying, yes, we contribute, but in the end, we are a bit slow, perhaps in some, to some extent a bit slower than others. Uh, this becomes more difficult with the uh, advancement of of the uh, EU initiatives and programs. Uh, uh, so the compass makes it even more difficult uh, to hide that there are groups of member states that are very well progressing and, and others, also by far not alone, that are slower. And so this discrepancy 
will become more and more difficult to, to let's say, not to face. Uh, I agree fully with you that one should probably, uh, one is probably well advised not too much focus on, on this uh, N word, uh, but to focus on the fact that the EU has uh, moved quickly, in my view, an institutional perspective quickly on CSTP in the last 15 years. Um, uh, just give you one example. I, I used to work for CPCC, the Civilian Missions Directorate. Uh, when it was created 15 years ago, it were five people. When I left a year ago, we were 100. So Europe advances and the, the um, uh, if you want to maintain uh, that, that uh, more security at EU level uh, is also more security for the Austrian level, then you have to think it until, until the end. Because even if you find scenarios where you think <laughs> you need the Irish clause, uh, I think you have also to realize that um, uh, by st staying out of the group, uh, you may also weaken the very system that you say is providing main element of security. In, in other words, uh, uh, always to say that, that you can be an honest broker and, and uh, uh, have a proactive neutrality policy is, is, is nice. And certainly I see potential for it, but uh, let's, let's take very con concrete cases or let's find concrete cases. Uh, and I find it, more and more difficult to, for myself, imagine cases where one member state could, could vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis a third country conflict, conflict only with third countries, and, and present itself as a broker without running the risk of being instrumentalized by those parties. Um, in any case, this is a, a, a thought uh, that one may pursue in order not so much to focus on the neutrality, but to look at uh, uh, these scenarios. And uh, I'm confident that there's, there's uh, uh, movement. Uh, I would also not get now too, too much uh, worried uh, or excited, some worried, some excited about uh, uh, NATO membership uh, of Finland and Sweden. When we look back the last 10 years, Finland and Sweden, took a completely different path, path from Austria, uh, much closer to, the, to, the, um, to NATO in the privileged partnership, uh, where we were only in the partnership for peace, much more focused on their defense industry, much more credible in their, in their um, contribution to, to crisis management, etc. So, for us, perhaps a lot of things to think, but definitely, uh, I think, uh, an hour of, of truth. Let me stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Jana, is there something you, you would like to add regarding Austria? Okay. Thank you. Uh, maybe a short reminder to conclude the second session. It is like speaking about national debate. It is exactly today that Denmark is holding a referendum on whether to overturn its defense uh, opt-out following a broad multi-party defense agreement reached after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. So it seems that more than 65% of Denmark's voters are expected to vote in, in favor of dropping this exemption and fully align Denmark on EU's defense and security policy. So let's see if it might inspire others. Let's move immediately to the, to the third and last session, and I would like to uh, roll it up in 20 minutes somehow, so to let time for the question uh, of the, the audience, of the, 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 the participants. Uh, so the, the, the third session is more on the, the influence, the consequences of the war, the return of war in Europe on the strategic compass. So as we said, uh, Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine is definitely a geop geopolitical awakening, uh, calling into question many of Europe's fundamental assumptions. The conflict in Ukraine has certainly brought closer 
the points of view between the Central European and Western European countries, which was, I guess, good for the achievement of the compass. However, as a strategy conceived and largely drafted in the days before Vladimir Putin changed the world, if I may say so, the strategic compass might simply have been overtaken by events. Some narrow-minded souls even point out that the war in Ukraine killed the strategic compass while rejuvenating and overhauling NATO, which two years ago had been uh, diagnosed brain dead it is certainly over exaggerated, but now that the whole defensive posture against Russia relies on the trans transatlantic link, it is a matter of fact that no one will rush to stand up a new EU force. The war in Ukraine, and I will stop here, is also challenging European strategic autonomy at the financial level. We see millions of euros devoted by the EU institutions to support Ukraine and tomorrow to deal with the re reconstruction, the rebuilding of the country and to support the member states which provide military assistance to Ukraine to manage the energy transition following the interruption of Russian gas and oil flows to welcome the refugees and so on and so on. So not, not much might be left for the implementation of the strategic compass, especially its invest chapter. Not much will be left for spending more and better as Yana highlighted uh, and as the compass calls for. So is the, mom the, the European momentum already over? I don't think so, but to address this question, I will successively offer the floors to Stefan Huber, then Saskia Stachowicz and then Yana Pulierin. Stefan, you have yeah. the floor. I'm very thankful that uh, Jan and yourself, you have uh, referred to the Commission uh, initiatives uh, because a few, a few weeks before the Compass was finalized, the Commission uh, has, has uh, presented its own package in February. Uh, for those who want to look it up, it's Commission Communication 2022-60. Uh, um, and we should read the Compass together with it because uh, it's a European effort and all EU institutions will certainly the commission in a very important role uh, push and support uh, the uh, different actions of the compass. Uh, and some of these uh, ideas may sound quite uh, um, revolutionary to some, uh, even those ideas have, have also a past uh, in the in the um, uh, capacity development plan, so are not new new, but uh, are renewed and more forcefully uh, presented. Um, we will uh, see a, a lot of documents still coming this year from the Commission on this. So I uh, I think that the institutional capacities of both institutions uh, are uh, strong enough uh, to to fulfill the uh, commitments of the implementation plan. Uh, and uh, so in my view, the, the compass is really a timely uh, exercise and has, has not been uh, overtaken or even rendered obsolete uh, by, by the war in Ukraine. Um, uh, you asked also about the uh, the language on, on China, how, how much, uh, I'm sorry, on, on Russia, how much it has uh, uh, changed uh, in the last uh, drafting phase. Uh, uh, you will discover in the compass that there's only a few uh, words, sentences on Russia and also on, on, on China. So, so uh, but you can, uh, read through the document and you will discover that many of the measures uh, are, are answers and, and uh, 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 measures that should address the uh, geopolitical uh, challenges of uh, what, uh, what the Compass calls Russia, a strategic challenge uh, and, and, and a threat. Um, uh, 
Well, it's more on the question whether the compass is obsolete. Uh, I would again like to, to look into the last decade of CSTP developments. Uh, we, we have uh, had a huge number of, of uh, initiatives uh, that prepared the path, as I said, uh, but also that made it only possible to react so fast in the first place without EUMS, the military uh, staff, uh, MPCC, uh, the military planning and capability, uh, 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 with, without uh, strongly planned uh, CSTP services at BES, this would simply not have been uh, possible. Uh, so uh, again, I see the compass as, as the result of, of a dynamic uh, uh, CSTP in the past years. And in my view, it couldn't have been adopted at a, at a better moment. Uh, uh, I would like to cite uh, German security policy expert and diplomat Thomas Bakker, who did an article in the uh, FAZ a um, few months ago, uh, basically saying security policy is only re relevant uh, for, for the politicians and for society when individual citizens are affected by it. And so in that sense, the, the uh, I think the compass is a chance and the timing uh, unfortunate or fortunate uh, is, is a, a moment when we all feel very closely affected by uh, uh, threats, uh, threats, uh, threat scenarios are somehow uh, abstract. So uh, I think <coughs> the relevance of the compass is, is underpinned by different past and current crises. Uh, and so for me, the relevance of the compass, uh, and even more so, I started with words of HR VP Borrell, so I end with it. Uh, Europe is in danger. The uh, compass confirmed uh, uh, the uh, dramatic, uh, the, the dramaticity of the, of the situation and the challenge. Let me stop here. Thank you, thank you, Stefan. Saskia, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, well, to me, the big question is, it's not a provocative or cheeky question at all, so, but one that interests me, what you all have to say about this. But what would we do different in EU's engagement with Russia and the war on Ukraine today if we had everything implemented that's in the strategic compass? Um, and, I, and probably, it wouldn't be so different because what is keeping us or what is paralyzing us is not the fact that we don't have shared infrastructures or, or capabilities, that too maybe, but there's another element here and that is the political questions of what we want to achieve and what we want to address. And I, this goes back to my earlier point about strategy is nothing without political goals. It can only ever exist in relation to those. And I think no strategic document and no action plan can do that for us. This is something that needs to be worked out. And um, so in this sense, it's certainly not obsolete, but it raises different questions and probably helpful questions uh, towards developing the the compass further but there's one aspect about the russian war against ukraine that i would like to highlight because i think it points to to an omission in the in the strategic compass and that is the issue of gender we've seen with the russian war uh, rampant sexual violence gender-based violence violence in the war we've seen militarism authoritarianism connected with outdated notions of masculinity that are driving this war, that are driving political violence. Um, we're seeing gender roles being reaffirmed, very stereotypical ones, even though Ukrainian women do also engage in the war militarily. 
Then we have seen the many gendered and racialized patterns of migration regimes and violent borders, where this perception of, of Ukrainian refugees as women and children as like us has been mobilized in many ways. So um, I'm bringing this up to say, uh, if we are not, if the EU is not better equipped to do a gender analysis, of the crisis and war in its neighborhood, it will also be ill-equipped to address gendered insecurities. It will not be well placed to, to come up to protect civilians, to come up with egalitarian uh, gender regimes in post-conflict reconstruction, and it will continue to destabilize regions. So this is not a side issue or add-on. I think this goes to the core of how we want to engage with conflict and war in our neighborhood. And um, the compass does talk about gender briefly. It references gender as important. It says women have special needs, um, but mostly refers to them in their passive status as victims, draws up rather technocratic solutions in terms of we have to get more women involved in the, in, in the uh, operations and so on and so forth. So I'm, I would really like to advocate for a more meaningful engagement with these issues, especially if we come back to this question of identity again, because gender egalitarian systems, gender equality is very central to what we understand to be European identity, and we're drawing it up all the time to make a point. So I think uh, this would be a chance to really follow up uh, and, and create a strategy that is able to get to these extremely relevant societal power relations that are being reproduced in conflict. Thanks. Thank you so much. To your knowledge, Stefan, will, will there be any, any implementation papers coming on on this specific aspect of gender? I've not heard about anything. But... Yes, certainly for for this uh, for this, um, for the CSTP operations, uh, I think it was only uh, last week that that um, the director general for personnel and the, the, the senior gender advisor have have uh, um, uh, briefed the PSC um, about. Um, uh, the situation, and if I'm not wrong, the gender advisor has announced a um, uh, strategy paper for for the missions. Thank you, Jana. The final word is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I try to address the three questions and then um, try to to do an outlook. Um, so, how has the war in Ukraine influenced the rewriting of the compass? I think there is definitely, or there was definitely more unity when it comes to threat analysis. Um, so a sentiment of all hands on deck uh, between the member states. I think the war changed the member states' commitment to defense spending quite significantly. Um, you see that all over Europe. You see that in the Versailles Declaration that was then included um, into the compass, this commitment uh, to spending. Um, I think that that was a game changer. I think also the European Peace Facility um, turned out to be a tremendously important and valuable tool. Um, I think it wasn't seen as such by all member states prior to the war. There was, when I remember correctly, and it was a, it's a German pet project, basically. It was a result of the German council presidency, but the, the peace facility was not kind of a beloved pet project of all member states, but I think now it really showed how significant um, it is. And another question was kind of did the like, oh, how, how did the perception of Russia change? And I think it, it changed quite significantly because I remember that when I read the first widely leaked draft of the Compass um, last autumn, and I was super surprised and actually not very happy to see the language on Russia and China back then, especially. Um, on Russia and to see that, um, I don't know, it, it, it first um, time it was mentioned was uh, kind of way into the compass. I think now it's very much uh, more front and center. So I think the language on Russia has changed significantly um, and um, the perception of Russia um, has changed as well. The, the compass mirrors this um, and I think this is, this is very good. Um, 
the question, how would the security compass um, change the way the EU addresses such crisis at its door? Um, and I think, so if we, if we take the compass and if we fast forward and do what, um, uh, um, what Daskia has basically uh, suggested, so to, to, to make this thought um, exercise, all the measures implemented, um, all the basically action boxes ticked uh, off the compass, I think we would be kind of two years down the road, three years down the road, much better prepared um, for a confrontation with Russia um, because of, uh, I think we would have much better military mobility in Europe. It would be much easier to move um, equipment from one country to the other. I think we would have ideally more strategic enablers um, and, and some huge gaps closed. I think we would be more independent um, from the United States. Um, having more strategic enablers. I think we would see more resilient European societies, more resilience of the global commons, um, as better equipped uh, when it comes to um, cyber security and hybrid threats. So I, I think the Compass actually has a lot to say about how or what we need to do now in order to, to be more resilient and uh, capable of uh, yeah, enduring a, a long-term confrontation of managing this. Um, so my third point would be on, not as if the compass is outdated, but things that I think we if we would basically now start to, to, to draft the next one, I think need to take into account. And, and actually I'll start with the unity because I think that um, the, war on Ukraine created this moment of unity, but I think you already see it fading. Uh, you already see cracks emerging um, between member states. Um, I was recently at a defense conference in Prague, and it was a conference where mem mem member states, like European uh, member states of the CEE region were present, but also Nordic countries. And I saw how they basically perceive themselves right now in this crisis. Uh, namely as leading and as diverging from uh, what comes from France and Germany um, when it comes to commitment to supporting Ukraine, but also to outlook how to deal with Russia after the war is over. So I think we should be very careful now um, to, to, to use this moment wisely as long as unity still holds and to, to do everything we can to, to keep Europe together and, and to bridge the, the, the gaps that are already emerging, which I I actually see uh, quite quite openly um, at the moment. Another thing which I think we should be really well aware of is that, I mean, I was very happy to see NATO and EU relationship um, clarified. Um, I think it was also, I mean, that was already uh, in the compass, but I think um, also here, um, the, the, the complementarity was emphasized even more because of the war, um, or at least that's what I heard from from Germans involved in the writing um, process. But I think we should be um, very careful when we look at the rebirth of NATO. I'm happy to see it personally. I want to sustain it, but we need to be well aware that in 2024, there's another election in the United States um, and that uh, the war is not popular in the United States. So Joe Biden's course is not something that brings him a lot of votes in the midterm election. So I think this commitment to Europe, this US commitment to Europe is very fragile. And so we need to prepare for this. And I think um, at the moment we kind of enjoy the cozy experience of a transatlantic honeymoon, but, and we are not preparing enough. And I think I, I want us to be, to be careful here um, because I think if the United States has a different president. I'm not saying that they will kind of depart from Europe immediately, but we need to, to brace ourselves um, that we might be uh, left more alone um, than at the moment. And the United States is the crucial factor for this unity right now. What I also think um, is, is, uh, will be a problem in the future is um, China, because uh, in the compass, the language on China basically did not change very much in reaction to the war, or did not change at all, or kind of the whole perception of China. And I think that is not very future oriented, um, because when I see the alliance between Russia and China emerging, 
um, the document uh, of 4th of February between the two countries, the support that China uh, provides for uh, Russia's action, and also the push from the United States to see these two theaters, basically the Indo-Pacific and um, the Eastern flank as two theater, these two theaters as one, I think uh, Europeans will be asked in the very, very near future to position themselves also militarily on the China question. And the, the compass does not answer this, but I think it's a direct consequence of the war um, that, we see, that we see. And last but not least, um, I think everything that was said on the danger to securitize different areas too much and to yeah, to, to basically, and the, the kind of that we need to continue to be mindful um, of, of, of this, I think is very true. At the same time, that is something where I think the compass is really spot on and the Borel forward is even more spot on because I think what we need to prepare is for is that our adversaries kind of use um, their engagement in our neighborhood also strategically. So I think we see a more geopoliticized um, European neighborhood. We see that already with this conscious attempt to block um, food deliveries from kind of Ukraine to Africa and to, um, to the Middle East. And I think I actually appreciated the thinking in the compass a lot that, um, that Borel said, um, yeah, it's, it's about it's about new means of warfare, basically. And, and, and I think that prepares us quite well. And I think that the compass doesn't um, address these issues enough. And I think we need to, to, to think more about this in the future. Well aware that there are dangers and, and that if others use migration as a, as a security threat, we shouldn't react kind of embracing this narrative and frame it as such, but we need to be aware that others are thinking of using different dependencies and different methods of kind of weakening us internally. Thank you very much. Full personal agreement with your remark on China. I have the feeling that the Compass is downplaying the threat posed by China to the multilateral rules based order vouched for by the, by the, by the EU and the relevance to Europe of what is surely the center of gravity uh, of the 21st century, the Indo-Pacific region. It's a bit like the EU is more acting as a regional power than a global global one. So yeah, it's a, it's a source of, uh, of concern. I agree with you. Thank you so, so much. It's time to wrap up uh, this uh, workshop, this discussion. I will actually not try to wrap up our discussion because it was, it was really extremely rich and uh, enlightening. Just maybe to insist on the, um, yeah, on the need to maintain the political momentum on the strategic compass. I think uh, it's definitely a realistic way forward for EU security policy in the near term, at least. And yeah, we will see if the, if the, the member states will demonstrate the necessary political will to actively engage themselves in the implementation process by addressing key issues such as speeding up decision making, closing the capability shortfall gaps, and being better prepared for acting and securing, which are goals of the strategic compass. Thank you so, so much. Uh, I would like to open the floor to questions and answers by the, by the three panelists. Oh, I see many, <laughs> many arms uh, raising in the, in the, in the room, I would like to make sure that I don't have to activate something. Maybe Saskia, you know how it works. <laughs> uh, we have to activate something to allow so. the. I no? think okay. you would be seeing it. If there was something, the chat would show you a little. Ah, okay. There would be a little sign. Okay. So we presume that there, there is no online. I think you can presume. Question yes. for the time being. Okay. So sorry, raise again the. Yeah, please, sir. Um, May I ask you to shortly identify yourself or at least your affiliation? Thank you. 
Oh, I think that uh, Jana cannot hear you well. Okay, uh, let me. I speak. Yeah, speak. thank you. Is it better, Jana? And okay, and so on. Uh, uh, I, have, I have two issues I want to address. Uh, one concerns the which was talked uh, mainly. The whole issue mainly addressed the Saskia. Uh, one is the, of course, very present the cleavage between our our being mutual and what we actually do. And I, I do realize the danger, as Saskia has pointed out, of, of the public opinion divide, diverging widely from what we actually do. That if, if there's no political coverage for this uh, thing, then that might be. I do not see the danger, A and B, I do not see how the gap can be bridged. First of all, uh, uh, as Stefan has mentioned, we actually are very, uh, very active contributors uh, to the common defense and security policy and also in the military field. As well, so as well. um, and basically, we, there's, there's no difference between us, great difference between us and other members. And on the other hand, there's the public opinion which says, <laughs> Things are not connected. Uh, the, there's the security uh, policy and there's the neutrality. The neutrality had the security function only in times of Cold War. Since the Cold War ceased to exist, it has no longer a security function. Full stop. Yeah. Uh, they, they, basically, we do whatever is necessary and call it neutrality. Let me remind you, for instance, that during the last weeks, we made the transition of heavy weapons to Austria to the war, war zone, which is clearly against neutrality. I mean, it's most narrow that we under in security policy. So neutrality is connected with our sense of identity. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, a qualified independence from Germany connected with an nation group of being a, a nation also to be growing in the <laughs> plus a certain aversion to war in which is uh, plausible in view of the Austrian the centuries of Austrian history and so Oscars so I think basically the, the, the two things are in, uh, I, I do realize that it would perhaps be we should perhaps drop the pretext of neutrality and that would, would kind of it, eventually the gap could be closed. Uh, but I think at the moment, uh, other than in Sweden, there was, was a, in Finland, there was a uh, was support for the NATO membership, right on the 60 70 percent, and so on. In Austria, 90 percent of the population is for, 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 for maintain, maintaining the so called neutrality. You cannot, in this crisis period, General, you cannot ask a politician to open a other new cleavage in another society. So you do whatever is necessary and, and, and call it, and continue to say that this that, that, that is very And what is necessary is exactly what the Sweden and Finland did as long as they did call themselves neutral or not. And then, a very close cooperation with NATO. And this, in the case of Austria, would mean the alignment in terms of armament, in terms of, of structures, of, 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 of and, and so on and so on. I think this, this, has, this is what has, has to be done in practical terms, and also when we now start to uh, spend more on, on the military. The second issue is also a very important one raised by Saskia. Uh, I, I, I agree with London that, that we have to uh, realize that the, the NATO pillar is not very solid and uh, that, that, that it's likely that medium election will change the powers in the Senate and in the House of Representatives and the election in 24, 24 might change to come, bring, come back, which is not only an entertainment question, but 
got the close co connection between Trump and the dislike or with the open and the Russia when this is a totally new axis. We cannot rely on, on this one. So uh, the second thing is, 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 but also Saskia said, what, what can, uh, there is a certain danger of, uh, I don't call it over military city, but we need a lot of military, but uh, I think this is the narrowing the perspective. Um, and I, I look at myself for the little contribution to the Austrian brochure for the site, for the uh, study campus. I mentioned and I ask you to be su as succinct as possible because we have many questions. Thank you. Maybe, uh, that we have that, say, uh, that we also have to emphasize other tools in conflict prevention. And, and, and for instance, let me point to China. I think we are, there is a green polarization dangerous to the, the third war looming there, you know. And so if we are not a strong power, at least we can try to somehow build a, something like a we see in, in the Pacific and you know, try to get our influence to, to mitigate the fund security platforms. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's grab two or three questions and then we will turn back to the sir. Please so keep so your say, uh, good news. I'm very short. <laughs> okay, super. Please uh, identify yourself. I'm quickly. an academic and a military person. Uh, there's a combination which is quite often. So, at least in the various countries. Uh, I'd like to start with the academic side as you know, Professor Biscop. Mm -hmm. He is a Belgian expert in the Egmont Institute, and he has said, well, the wording compass is a very modest one. No? It's a, it does a purposeful because it, it's, it's a modest it's a thing. No? It's, it's a very modest. And in terms of the military aspects, the force of generation focuses on about 5,000 uh, personnel of uh, troops. And this would include uh, the naval, uh, air, and uh, army uh, the personnel. So you can say, as, if I may use the, the Austrian the phrase here, it's a Mickey Mouse, huh? yeah. honestly. And the force of uh, the generation. So uh, talking uh, about the Austrian, the benefit here or the attitude, I think that our the, the professional army element, which is the dominant, which is not constitutional, constitutional, it should be a militia army, not a militia component, but the, the army should, uh, the armed forces should be a militia armed force. This is so not implemented. So linked with the compass, I think that the, this. Uh, uh, the side which is now practically ruling here in the armed forces is quite happy because it's a very it's a modest opportunity, but big enough to bring enough uh, people, uh, officers of a higher rank into some international institutions, and that's it. And this is the Mickey Mouse again, yeah? it's, uh, what, what I would say. And I'm not against the EU, but the EU has uh, a long history of attempts to attempt uh, uh, the, the military as a defense concept is started as we want to go. Of course, because we want to be short uh, into the history deeply, but as I say, just to recommend to look up the WEU uh, aspects entering the EC. And then we had a headline goal is 60, is 1,000, 120,000. Nothing happens. And the commission, starting with the, the, the former uh, the president of the commission, kept on talking and writing and uh, paying uh, the documents for the institute, including Mr. Biscop, uh, to produce the, the, the will and the effort and the compass and the aim and strategy and everything in numerous uh, papers. And again, very uh, modest. And this is what I want to say, yeah. and uh, I hope this will, will change. Indeed, Yana, Yana, at the beginning of her presentation, made a reference to these Helsinki headline goals of 60,000 people, which is a bit preoccupying for the, this difference with the newly uh, created uh, first action uh, force. Thank you so much. I saw, yes, uh, please. I'm Rikishai, uh, a researcher at Vienna University. 
Um, I have a question on um, issues such as cyber attacks, cyber warfare, um, disinformation, because those are tools that are used a lot by Russia, for instance. So I would be interested in how far those are included in the strategic process on the one hand. And I would also be interested in how you evaluate the um, political will of the member states to implement actions in those areas. Thank you. We will stop here for the time being and give back the floor to the to the panelists. So Yana, I hope you heard the last question. It was about cybersecurity, how uh, how it is included, how these issues are uh, addressed in the strategic compass, and how which answer will be will be will be might be given based on the strategic compass. And the two, the first question was more Austria oriented. So I guess you. You wish to skip this one and the second you heard was more on the yeah this mickey mouse uh, effect of the strategy compass and uh, the fact that such promises in terms of forces generation of forces have already been made long ago by the eu without concrete results so uh, yeah so i give i give the floor to the three panelists please Saskia, would you like to? Um, yes, to start? Uh, just very briefly. I think it's very interesting what you're raising, Thomas. That actually we can be content with just having a public opinion that's hung up on neutrality and then do something else. Uh, and and one could take that position. I'm I'm not saying it, it's unsustainable. I just think that we're also today we have treated security politics and foreign politics basically or foreign policy basically as the same thing, and I don't think they are. And I think we can have a tech technocratic security politics that is above neutrality and does what needs to be done. But I think we're risking not cultivating something that we're lacking as is, you know, a, a true foreign policy culture where we can ask, you know, what kinds of political de developments do we want to see in the world? How can we sustain peace together with other um, nations? So I would see a danger there um, of, of slipping into a technocratic angle about this. Um, and just briefly, Elke's question about cyber attacks, um, that is mentioned and the others can probably say more about this. What I think is interesting is that this notion of cyber threats was so very strong just until recently. So I think we're seeing right now, superficially speaking, uh, a growing concern now with traditional threats more. But this issue is very much at the heart of many of the strategic and security discourses uh, in the EU today. And if you're interested in that, I would also recommend looking beyond the CSDP, because this issue is very much discussed in innovation technology. So this becoming the EU becoming a security actor is happening in all kinds of policy fields and many of the issues are so cross-cutting that we cannot only look at CSDP to fully understand it from a scholarly perspective I would say. Stefan, would you Just answer? very short on the question uh, about political will. Uh, uh, I think we have also to be a bit just with, with in the judgment of, of uh, governments and, and uh, administrations. Um, the political will, uh, when you have different priorities, you always have to uh, keep in mind that security policy is competing with other national priorities. And, and uh, <laughs> the defense minister that goes back from Brussels uh, and meets his finance minister uh, uh, has, uh, has often not the, the stronger hand. Uh, but compared to to what I've seen in my many years in Brussels, uh, I, I really, that's why I mentioned the yes, we can moment. You, you have really the, the sense of, of the dynamic. It's, it's not just that you see papers rolling and, and uh, doesn't change much except uh, destroying perhaps a forest. I feel really very much this sense of commitment uh, then to, to live up to it is, is of course, uh, a work that exactly involves those many processes that the Compass wants to accelerate, uh, because the processes, national and European, uh, are uh, gradually brought together, but you still have to go through these processes. If you want to do something on first generation for attracting more female candidates, you have to do a whole setup. Uh, to, to make it possible for them to leave the career paths, uh, uh, the, the financial package, 
social uh, arrangements, I mean, social uh, security uh, arrangements, and so on. So uh, many of the things you can find in the compass uh, uh, will involve uh, a huge uh, administrative uh, implementation work. And this, you, you cannot just uh, go to breach uh, laws or uh, overturn laws, you have to go through the legislative process. But such a dynamic, frankly, uh, I have only seen in the Jacques Delors time of the uh, internal market. Thank you. Thank you. Jana, with apologies for the bad sound, would you like to, to answer? Yeah, I, I try um, as far as I understood. So on cyber, um, I think um, there is a lot in the compass. Uh, it is one of the focal points of the resilience chapter with the goal to um, see the EU as an enabler of more resilient societies and of a provider of security in areas that are not um, military or that don't have a military dimension. So I think in the resilience basket, that's why Especially, I think the French government wanted to talk about global commons and cyber as, as, as one of them. Um, so um, there is a commitment to strengthen the EU's um, cyber defense capabilities, and there is a hybrid uh, toolbox, uh, even a hybrid rapid respond, a response team uh, in there. So um, there, there is a commitment to boost the EU's own intelligence uh, capabilities and, and in the action boxes. I think this is this is really mirrored or identified as one of the um, most important areas, um, hybrid in general and cyber more specifically. Um, on, I did not really understand, like uh, acoustically understand the question on the Mickey Mouse uh, uh, force, but I, I just take the opportunity to bash <laughs> the rapid deployment capacity a bit more because I already did it in my introductory remarks. Um, so I think, I mean, I would love the idea to succeed, um, but this concept of the reformed battle groups plus additional forces, I still, and maybe Stefan can kind of help me here, I still fail to understand how this could work better than the non-reformed battle groups um, and all attempts we previously had, um, yeah, including um, the headline goal of 60,000. So I think the idea is that we will have the ability to draw on a pool of available forces, uh, including land, air, and maritime um, components, and that these forces will be able to call on strategic enablers. That is, I think, the idea, and that these components will regularly train and exercise together. But I think um, the problem is that it will still depend on the member states to provide forces to the rapid deployment capacity and some member states really hate um, this initiative um, and are really highly skeptical because they fear duplication. And those member states that have been particularly skeptical are those in Central and Eastern Europe who are, I guess, now even more reluctant. Um, the deployment of this uh, rapid uh, deployment capacity still requires consensus. Um, that was one of, uh, that is one of the main obstacles. Um, and I think we, we have attempts uh, to see a more flexible decision-making um, kind of process work, which I think is a, would be a huge advantage. The idea of Article 44 plus constructive abstention. I really hope this works. Um, and then um, maybe uh, it will be easier to deploy, but it's still, I think in order for it to succeed, it would still mean that the right member states with the right capabilities join the mission then. Um, and if they are not available or not willing, then the EU cannot move. And um, so, yeah, I think that, that many problems that uh, pre-existed continue to exist and that this is no silver bullet. Thank you, thank you very much. Just maybe one point to answer Elke's question. The uh, hybrid, the word hybrid is mentioned 46 times in the strategic compass, which seems, in my opinion, a bit out of sync with the fact that Russia is waging a very conventional war. I think it's what you, what you said, Saskia, in Ukraine at the moment, and by the way, has already lost the information battle somehow. So there is a kind of a disproportion between the, the compass and the, and the... Let's embark the rest of the questions. We have 15, 20 minutes, uh, please, sir. Yes. 
Thank you very much. I'm a doctoral student with the University of Vienna. Uh, now, in what way, since you mentioned China, yes, uh, in what way would you say, or what, I mean, would the experts here say, uh, do the comp does the compass uh, make Europe a more, for like, for better words, a more attractive strategic partner for emerging countries who are not necessarily full democracies like many countries in South Asia or South Asia? That's it. Thank you very much. Okay. Please. Yeah. I'm Kanga uh, Saito, Japanese in Australia. Please speak as loud as you can yeah. so Yana can uh, hear us. I'd like to ask you the question about the role and size of EU, both of EU battle group, uh, and the, and the strategic compass. So <clears throat> it would be difficult to, specific, to be specific, but uh, in which uh, situation or scenario would the would EU use? The EU force or EU battle. So, if it is for the Balkan or in Africa, it, it seems to be, it seems, it seems to me that it would be the same as the before the uh, Soviet Union. The, if it is against the full scale invasion, like uh, against Ukraine, or to support in the Pacific region, maybe to, it's not maybe enough. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Florian, please. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for allowing me uh, for an instant. I have a question regarding, I, I don't know who that said from the speakers, uh, not spend more, but spend better. Uh, how far does the strategic compass allow or intend an harmonization of standards? regarding the production of, uh, of weapons and, and, and weaponry, because as far as I was told, one of the problems is that the defense spending is so high that the, more or less each European country has its own production and, and, and different standard and, and so on, which seems also to be a problem now. Uh, for uh, Ukraine, that uh, it needs quite some time to train the soldiers on, not only on new equipment, but also on different, all that different equipment that is coming in. Whereas the, the Soviet or the Russian equipment might not have the same standard, but it's much easier to use. So, how far does the strategic compass also foresee uh, a, a more united? way of, of uh, standards and productions. Thank you. Sir. Hi. Lawrence Kappel, I'm with the Austrian Institute of European and Security Policy and a former Berlin Press of the OIOP. Um, the question is that I'll put it in a very short uh, term of the front of the team bit at the back. Basically, can Austria afford diplomatically or any otherwise to maintain its neutrality? Because the problem with the societal debate is that there has been a lot of misunderstandings about where Austria actually lies. You actually talk to people on the street and you say, well, didn't you know that Austria was part of K4, part of the NATO operation, or that it commanded other parts of UN peacekeeping missions, the EU missions, and they go, no, it didn't. Or if you say, oh, but what about the identity of neutrality in Austria? And you point, well, Sweden had a history of neutrality for 200 years, and if you don't think it wasn't part of their culture, it very much was. And just referencing very briefly the gentleman's point, because he was absolutely right to say that the polls in Austria is about 90% neutrality, and in Sweden that it was 60% in favour of uh, going into NATO after the invasion. Before the invasion, it was completely the opposite way. They had no intention of joining NATO. So given that the European security defense architecture has changed, there's no doubt about it, Sweden, Finland, Germany, we're seeing even potential referenda in Switzerland concerning some elements of its neutrality, and they've got a history of about 500 years. Can Austria afford to have a free rider mentality, simply relying on the fact that, oh, don't worry, 
we've got a buffer between us. Can it diplomatically afford neutrality anymore? Thank you. Uh, that's to everybody. Shall we give the floor back to the to the panelists? Yana, would you like to start? Did you did you get what was said? Can you can you summarize the question on the yeah, end so of the first question uh, was about the countries like southeastern Asian countries and which kind of partnership could be offered by the strategic compass? Which kind of relationship was it? Yeah. Did I get it? Uh, in what way does the compass play? Uh, you Europe a more attractive strategic partner for yeah in what way the strategic compass made Europe a more attractive partner for these countries of for example Southeast Asia the second remark by the military attaché of Japan was on the I think the, the topic has already been raised actually the size of the battle groups and the the, the but you you already answered the the question of yeah, we are uh, in a kind of st stalemate then we had a question from the uh, Austrian uh, permanent representative to the USE about the harmonization of standards regarding weapons in the strategic compass. How, how is it made possible in the compass? It's a quite technical question. And finally, a uh, more Austria-oriented question. I guess you, you wish to, to skip it once again uh, on the, on the uh, can, can Austria allow itself to keep this kind of the, yeah, what is basically neutrality and uh, yeah. So uh, yeah, would you like to start, Jana? So maybe also going beyond the compass. Um, so in the discussions about the partnership basket that that I've been um, participating in, um, kind of in, in a, an attempt uh, of um, outreach that member states did. I think there was a lot of discussion about how to um, position the EU as a better partner and how to make partnerships more diverse and also more attractive. Um, and also not to have a one size fits all approach, but to, yeah, to have a more granular approach towards partnerships. I think in the EU, uh, in the debates that I've been participating in, in those member states, um, there was, a, a, a big sense that, especially when uh, it comes to the Indo-Pacific, um, that we need to have more and more diverse partnerships also to basically yeah, diversify our, um, our approach in, in, in the region and to work more with um, countries in the Indo-Pacific and kind of to counterbalance, if you wish, China. Um, so I think there is a lot of appetite when it comes to maritime security when it comes to, for example, training, when it comes to um, also when it comes to um, equipping. Um, so I, I see that this is basically a growing business for the European Union. Um, when it comes to spending more and spending more cooperatively um, and, and aligning standards. So Reinhard Bütikofer just told me last week that the um, Commission is currently preparing something uh, about standards, but I don't have more details. Uh, but in I think in the compass, we see um, some promising initiatives like this annual defense ministerial meeting on the EU capability initiatives. Um, I think that will um, be very positive. I think with the defense innovation hub in the EDA um, um, with um, Hopefully, I mean, there is at least the idea in the compass that we uh, increase the size of the European Defence Fund, um, that we have maybe this um, VAT waiver for defence equipment, that is another idea. So I think there is a lot of in there to spend more cooperatively and to spend better, but it, of course, I see um, the problem, not only the, diff the, the, the standards, but also as I said, there is a lot of money now going to flood the European defense market. And what I think is a huge danger now is that we see a reverse post-2008 scenario. A colleague of mine, Nicole Kulich, has called it that way. So I'll steal it here because after 2008, um, with, the, um, with the financial crisis, we saw 27, or back then 28, member states cutting um, their defense spending without uh, coordinating, without cooperating, and, and kind of yeah, creating huge gaps in, in uh, when it comes to European capabilities. And now we could see the reverse so that, and especially now in Germany, because the timeframe to spend the money is 
seen as rather limited, um, that a lot of countries will buy whatever is available off the shelf just to fill their own uh, gaps, how they identify it. Um, and so I really wish for the EU um, to, to, to push for, for more cooperative uh, spending and better alignment. I think the seeds are there in the compass. It's really, I mean, it, it comes down to what it always comes down to, political will of the member states and sanity. And last word, maybe I think we should stop to talk about Sweden and Finland as neutral countries. They are uh, not neutral for quite some time now. They call themselves, I mean, prior to joining NATO militarily, non-aligned, so no member of a military alliance, but they are far from being neutral uh, since they entered the European Union. And I think they cannot be compared to Austria in any way. Thank you. Saskia, would you like to know? Okay. No. <laughs> yeah, perhaps very briefly on the on the issues of harmonization. I think the uh, uh, question of is more of a question of interoperability and and uh, um, definition of of standards, which are uh, basically NATO standards. I think here uh, interoperability has achieved already a level of uh, uh, compliance that is extremely high. What is now on the table is this package of the Commission that uh, Jana has referred to twice. Uh, um, I, uh, um, here it is now about uh, uh, promoting in a very structured way um, uh, joint procurement. The Commission will propose uh, uh, a regulation on joint procurement, which will define the criteria under which um, such a, uh, uh, actors and, and uh, uh, procurement measures can be can be done. Uh, the Commission will propose uh, a VAT exemption for it and what they call an EDF bonus, uh, as the European Defence Fund, the Commission instrument, uh, foresees uh, almost eight billion euros over its planning cycle. Uh, the Commission proceeds to uh, give a, a higher uh, support through EDF for those member states who buy uh, jointly. The benchmark is already old for joint uh, uh, collaborative uh, uh, procurement, as we was called so far. It was 35%. Today we are at 11%. Uh, so there is still a lot of progress to do. But now the, the package that the Commission is proposing includes also a task force on joint procurement. And I can tell you, having served in the Commission also as uh, head of the task force myself, uh, this task force is, uh, uh, um, are made to, uh, are created to make things happen quickly and uh, to propose to fill uh, a gap for which you will not just create another institution. So there's a very strong commitment from the Commission, because these things are not mentioned really in the, in the, in the compass. Uh, otherwise, just perhaps on the rapid deployment capacity, I think we will see uh, a number of more detailed uh, definitions and descriptions of the future RDC. Uh, I think there are some surprises possible, but uh, for the time being, what we can see uh, uh, in, in the compass and in the discussion between the member states, amongst the member states, uh, um, it is uh, linked, uh, for example, to the deployment of a CSDP operation in, in a, um, a non uh, uh, I mean, in an uh, environment that, that is not waiting for you to come. Uh, a non permissive environment is the military language to it. So uh, nobody thinks of opposing a, a big uh, um, uh, uh, armed force of an aggressor with 5,000 people. It is really a means to have a, a, a tool. And of course, everyone is right to point to the fact that the battle group has never been deployed. So the work that is now done by the EUMS and, and uh, national services is exactly to prepare the scenarios uh, and the planning of scenarios 
So to be able to accompany uh, military missions in terms of uh, deployment and in terms of evacuation. Anyhow, we will see more documents on that. Thank you. Thank you. It's five o'clock. We are perfectly on time. Thank you all. And thank you especially to our three keynote panelists. You made a great job. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time and expertise. I enjoyed this afternoon. Thank you. And we will make a report from it, which I make sure I will make sure that all of you, if you left us your email address, I will make sure that you receive it in due time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.